Welcome to Robert Wood Johnson University Hospitals Health Talk. I'm Dr. Douglas Shashinsky of Robert Wood Johnson Physician Enterprises, Warren Internal Medicine. Each year, 89,000 women are diagnosed with gynecologic cancer, a cancer that starts in the women's reproductive organs. On today's show, we will learn about the types of gynecologic cancers, risk factors, prevention, and treatment options. We are joined today by our special guest, Dr. Miha Sang, a gynecologic oncologist with Robert Wood Johnson University, Somerset, and the Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey. Dr. Sang is also an assistant professor of OBGYN Division of Gynecologic Oncology at Robert Wood Johnson uh, Medical School. Thank you for coming to the show. Thank you so much for inviting me. First, let's hear a little bit about your background, who you are, uh, with, uh, and what brought you uh, from uh, the Cancer Institute up to Robert Wood Johnson? Sure. Um, I was born and raised in New York. Um, and then I did my medical school training in New York. Um, and then I finally moved to New Jersey when I did my residency program for OBGYN. So I actually trained at Robert Wood Johnson in New Brunswick for, uh, for four years. Um, and then I stayed on um, as a part of a general OBGYN as part of the faculty there for a few years. And then I just wanted to get um, specialized training in gynecologic oncology. So I did my fellowship in University of Minnesota for three years. And then I came back home. So. Now, for most of the women who are going to yeah. be listening, what's the difference between sure. a gynecologic oncologist yes. and their regular OBGYN? Sure. So gynecologic oncologists are uh, physicians who specialize in treating only gynecologic cancers. So gynecologic cancers are uh, abnormal cells that grow um, that originate from their reproductive organs. So uterus, fallopian tubes, ovaries, um, cervix, vulva, vagina, those are some of the organs that we deal with specifically. And women should know to help prevent the, any of these abnormalities, what are some of the steps they should be doing? Sure. So for some of these um, cancers, there are um, some signs and symptoms they could look out for. So especially in the case of like endometrial cancer, some of the first signs are vaginal bleeding, especially um, in a postmenopausal woman. So let's say you haven't had your period for many years and then suddenly there's an episode of vaginal bleeding. Some women would kind of ignore it and say, maybe this is one time thing and you know not evaluate it further. Um, but we definitely encourage those women to seek out a gynecologist who will do the initial evaluation. Uh, because we definitely want to rule out endometrial cancer in those patients. So, you know, just detecting symptoms and uh, signs early so that you're able to seek help earlier. So what women really first of all need to know is the first thing to do is follow their, gynecologic, their gynecologist advice. Yes. Go see them yes. every year. Yes. After they've started, after age 22, they should start seeing, doing their pelvic and pap smears yeah. as directed by the American College yeah. of uh, uh, OBGYN. Yeah. They should consider getting their HPV uh, testing yeah. done at the yeah. same time as they get their pap smears. And if they do that, it's a less frequent uh, pickup of having to do the uh, pap smears. We're not doing them the yearly like yeah. we used to. We're not doing it with the speculate. We're not doing it as like we used to do. Yeah. And, but at the same time, catching uh, them even earlier, yes. and especially with the HPV virus, possibly reducing their risk down the road of developing any type of cancer. Sure, yes. It's very just very exciting um, because we have a vaccine that prevents cancer. I mean, where do you have a, you know, where can we find that? So it's, we're very excited just to have this vaccine that uh, prevents not only cervical cancer, but it decreases the incidence of benign genital warts, decreases vulva and vaginal cancers, as well as anal cancers, as well as head and neck cancers that are on the rise for males. Um, so this vaccine to prevent cancers, you know, for both female and male, um, we usually recommend at the start of, you know, before they become sexually active, around, um, it starts from age nine, but recommended uh, from 11 to 12, and actually just got approved by FDA to extend that age to 45 years old. So if you're a female who's 40, you've never had HPV vaccine, this is a, you know, this is a vaccine for you. So go to your gynecologist and say, you know, I want my vaccine. Again, a very important that we can yeah. prevent this. Prevent this before it actually comes. Because, you know, unfortunately, when women come with diagnosis of cancer, you know, we do have great options and treatment, but we're, we're in the business of preventing cancer. We don't want to be in the business of treating cancers only. So. And the prevalence of these type of cancers, 
what should women know? Yeah, so endometrial cancer is the most common gynecologic cancers. Um, and then, and, but fortunately enough, because of you know the early signs of bleeding, patients come in early and they're diagnosed at an earlier stage. Um, and then for ovarian cancer, although it's not as prevalent in women, it's we consider it the most deadliest cancer because they come in, um, p patients uh, present at such an advanced stage. And at that point, it's a little bit harder to bring them to a curative well, the biggest problem Stage. with ovarian yeah. cancer is that there is very little signs exactly. or symptoms of them yeah. until we get to a grade uh, three or four, and exactly. by that time, we've passed a lot of what we can do for treatment. Yeah, so unfortunately for ovarian cancer, it's not this one sign that you know, points to ovarian cancer. A lot of times it's very vague, um, sometimes like bloating, if you have signs of bloating, um, loss of appetite. You know, losing weight. Um, you know, just feeling full early. Those are, you know, some GI vague symptoms. Those are reasons to kind of talk to your physician about, you know, your concerns for possible ovarian cancer. And unfortunately, they are very vague signs. We can have the doughy abdomen, yes, yes. the uh, yeah. uh, feeling of fullness, the exactly. bloat. They'll come to their regular primary care doctor. Yeah. The regular primary care doctor will yeah. do some testing. Okay. We'll also most likely suggest that they get back to their gynecologist yes. for routine testing also. And even routine testing may not pick that up. They may have to go further. Exactly, exactly. So patients will, with ovarian cancer will often you know, present with GI symptoms for you know, many years and then finally an imaging test or some something um, will prompt them to get a CAT scan or something that will pick up ovarian cancer. So unfortunately, there's no good screening test for ovarian cancer. Uh, for cervical cancer, we have the pap smear that, or HPV testing as well that start at age 21. So we are able to pick up precancerous cells, you know, treat them before they become cancerous. Ovarian cancer, unfortunately, we don't have a good, great uh, screening tool. Oh, the nice thing, again, we go yeah. back to cervical cancer. It's yeah. almost like colonoscopies to yes. make sure that with people don't have polyps, which can develop into colon cancer. It's sure. similar yes. that the with the women that you can go to the get the uh, pap smear. It's actually no longer pap smear. It's now the thin prep yes. and or with the HPV yes. added on top. And the women should ask for that HPV to be done. Exactly, yep. And that can help reduce the risk of them developing any type of cancer. Or if it's positive, then they can be screened even further for the type of cancers that yeah. are associated with the HPV virus. Yes. So, you know, we definitely recommend going to a gynecologist, you know, for the thin prep uh, screen test as well as HPV um, testing. And then, you know, we do them every three years, depending on what age group you are, or every five years. Uh, but just getting that will prevent cervical cancer down the road if we're able to catch it in time. Do women need to be worried about genetic factors that are, are associated or affiliated with gynecologic cancers? Yes, so you know some of these cancers that we you know uh, treat, endometrial cancer, ovarian cancer, are part of uh, the genetic um, syndromes. So you know patients with extensive family history of certain cancers are more susceptible to getting these cancers. So if you're ever worried um, about having a lot of family members near you having cancers, um, there's actually a great genetic counseling uh, program at Somerset that offers free genetic counseling to these patients. Um, absolutely free, um, offered by Somerset um, Hospital. And you could go there, you know, speak to uh, a counselor who's actually trained in genetics to really give your family history and then see what genetic test needs to be ordered. Um, once we get that, um, if you are, have BRCA mutations, that increases your chance of getting breast cancer as well as ovarian cancer. And patients who have um, those mutation carriers can actually get surgery to prevent cancers. So it's very, very important to just be aware of your family history so that we could have a discussion um, of your you know, risk of having these cancers. Again, it goes back to seeing your primary care doctor yeah. as well as your OBGYN. Exactly. Yep. And even if the OBGYN is acting as your primary care doctor, yeah. going through your family history, yes. consideration if your family history is suggestive of anything, yep. Uh, the uh, people who run uh, Robert Johnson Somerset Medical Center have determined that it's so important exactly. that we have a genetic uh, counselor that uh, can see these people go yeah. through genetic, can go through the family tree, exactly. yep. f help figure out whether or not these people are at higher risk, yeah. and then go on for further testing based on those higher risks. Exactly. And someone's, you know, sometimes, you know, just for me, knowing just my family history is kind of hard. So when we have a, you know, a specific counselor dedicated to just, you know, going over for all the family history, I could go back to my family and say, you know, is there a history of this? Is there a history of this? You know, it's something that prompts us to think more about it. Uh, so, 
in addition to the HPV vaccine, are there other things that women can do to prevent gynecologic cancers? So some other risk factors, especially for you know endometrial cancer, you know, late later age of menopause, um, just having tamoxifen use, especially for breast cancer, it can increase your risk. Um, having estra, uh, extra estrogen. But the most common risk factor for endometrial cancer is unfortunately obesity. Um, so women with obes obesity, you know, just having lifestyle changes, healthy eating, um, exercising, those are things that we could actually modify to decrease our risk for getting endometrial cancer. So again, going to the, the plant uh, diets, yeah. reducing the red meats, yeah. increasing the exercise, yeah. reducing alcohol consumption, yeah. And reducing their BMI can hopefully reduce their risk of developing gynecologic cancers. Exactly. In addition to, of course, giving the HPV vi Vac vaccine, vaccine yeah. which can now be done till age 42 and 45. 45 yeah. And in, in males can be done and also. And males, yes. We strongly encourage um, all boys and all girls to be vaccinated. Um, right now, I don't think it's mandatory to be vaccinated, but we strongly encourage because this is a vaccine that can change lives. Um, cervical cancer worldwide um, is, you know, second most common cancer and can kill many women uh, per year because of the cancer. So if we could prevent it, and we had the vaccine to prevent it, I strongly encourage, you know, parents to take their children to see their pediatricians to get these vaccines. Again, some certain yeah. things that we can do to prevent. Exactly. Uh, we can't we can't uh, induce women yeah, no, to we, have menopause yeah. later exactly. <laughs> later on in life. Yeah. We can't uh, you know women who are uh, going on estrogen replacement therapy. Yeah, yeah. We have to of course talk to them about exactly. the increased risk of cancers. Yeah. If the women are on any type of birth control, that's also a, a discussion that they'll yeah. have with the gynecologist prior to going on. Yeah, certain things are out of our control. You know, the more I work with these women, certain things are out of control and it's not our fault. But there are certain things that are within our control and what we can do to prevent these cancers. You know, so I you know, have long discussions with my patients just to, because I'm excited about this and I'm passionate about this just to prevent cancers. Well, there's, there's not a lot yeah. of things that we can do to exactly. prevent. Exactly, no, we can't, unfortunately. And this yeah. is one vaccine that we can do. It's, yeah. uh, you know, it's like when you take your uh, vet, your animal to the vet and yeah. they said that they can give them distemper vaccine yeah. and that reduces the risk of them developing cancer. Yeah. This is something that we can give to exactly. younger, uh, younger women, younger men yes. and prevent Improving. cancer. Exactly. There's not a lot of things that no, we can we say cannot. prevent. Exactly. So, you know, we, it's funny because we want to eradicate cancer. Let's prevent cancer and then, you know, develop treatment protocols, develop, you know, clinical trials to treat those cancers and eradicate cancers. But let's do the first step. Um, to prevent the cancers first. So now we're finished with the first step of prevention. Yes. yes. Now, how do we? How does a woman find that she has something? Yeah. So you know, let's. So just getting a regular um, annual checkup by a gynecologist is important because they'll do a pelvic exam. They'll do a full thorough exam so that you know if there's anything worrisome, um, they could get a biopsy or they could get imaging pelvic ultrasound to see if there's anything abnormal that needs to be further evaluated by perhaps a gynecologic oncologist. So, you know, a lot of times that, uh, just getting a biopsy is the first step. And then once that is diagnosed, um, then further treatments such as surgery or, or chemotherapy or radiation are some other treatment options that we offer patients with uh, gynecologic cancers. Now again, since you are a gynecologic yeah. uh, oncologist, tell us a little bit about the treatments that are available at Robert Wood Johnson Somerset yeah. Medical Center. I'm uh, very honored to be part of CINJ, which is the uh, New Jersey Cancer Institute of New, New Jersey. Um, it's actually New Jersey's only um, NCI designated comprehensive cancer center. So what is that? It's like a team of internationally recognized uh, members who uh, bring exciting cutting edge um, just trials to our hospital, especially at Somerset and New Brunswick and all of uh, Robert Wood Johnson uh, Rutgers Health. So we offer clinical trials specifically for gynecologic cancers um, that can help them, you know, hopefully cure uh, cancer. Being that we are part of the uh, Cancer Institute, yeah, yeah. what's important is the fact that they are getting international uh, health care at a local setting. Exactly. They don't, they don't have to travel to New no, York City to not. any yeah. of those places. Yeah. And since they're close to home, they'll be with family, friends, exactly. and they'll have all of the support necessary yeah. Yeah. in addition to getting as as good or possibly better treatment than they would at some uh, place in New York. Exactly. So we have, you know, trials are open to us that are internationally um, run as well as uh, in the 
United States. Um, so there, we offer a lot of uh, clinical trials at CINJ that we are also bringing to Somerset as well. So you don't have to travel far um, to get the same trials that they may offer or even different trials that we only offer at CINJ. Um, so a lot of these trials are started by members of CINJ that are only available at CINJ. So we're very lucky just to have a program like that um, here at Somerset as well as in New Brunswick. And we also have the whole uh, Rutgers Medical School faculty yeah, yeah, yeah. so that, uh, again, we can add that onto the Cancer Institute also. Exactly. So we have researchers who are looking specifically at these cancers, um, possible treatments, and then translating that research into actual clinical trials to really benefit patients who have these. So it's not just in the laboratory where you're just working with mice, we're actually bringing the results of those um, studies actually into clinical uh, practice. And in fact, last night at the yeah, uh, meeting, the uh, head of the medical school talked all about the mm -hmm. fact that uh, they've had, been, they've been able to hire more, uh, pro more principal investigators yeah. and that they are translating everything from the beaker yeah. and the uh, uh, lab table to medical care. Exactly, yeah. So, you know, as a gynecologist oncologist, we actually offer chemotherapy to our patients too. So we do not only just perform surgeries, you know, we also pr um, provide chemotherapy care as well. So we, you know, really provide comprehensive care to our patients uh, from the beginning of diagnosis to actually throughout the whole treatment until, you know, um, at the end. Um, so it's really exciting for us to be involved in those clinical trials and really just, you know, be involved with other collaborators as well in the medical school as well as, you know, other researchers. Yeah. So the other treatments that we have available, you're talking about chemotherapy. Yeah. Yes. So we have... So so there's chemotherapy as well as immunotherapy, um, and then we have also work with our radiation oncologists for specific cancers such as endometrial cancer, cervical cancer, vulva, vaginal cancers. Um, we can offer radiation as well. Um, we are very lucky to have a phase one program that look at uh, drugs at a very early stage, but it provides you know promises exciting uh, results for these patients. Um, immunotherapy is one of the you know, things that are very exciting to us because, you know, it really works with our immune system to attack these cancer cells in our body. Um, so just combining all these uh, modalities that we have for treatment, you know, we're, we have a lot of things to offer patients. Again, we have so much to offer yeah. in community settings, both at Somerset the Medical Center, yes. Robert Wood Johnson, New Brunswick, yeah. part of the Cancer Institute and the and Medical School, yeah. and all of the other facilities that are uh, part of yeah. Robert, Robert Wood Johnson Barnabas Healthcare. Yes, yes. Yeah and being able to do all of this in your home environment yeah. area also. Yeah. And that you offer chemotherapy, you offer the radiation yeah. therapy, radiation yeah. oncologists, you have the immunotherapy, which probably is the future of what uh, taking care of cancer yeah. is. So especially at Somerset, you know, I, I work there uh, two times a week, but just having everything in one building where everything is just there, it's so convenient for the patients, especially when you're sick, you don't want to be traveling far to all these different places. Um, just having family nearby and support system, I think that really is very important in your cancer care. Um, and then ha just having all that um, support and just treatment right in your neighborhood, I think is one of the best um, best things that you know we could offer to patients. Actually. Well, we offer them, they can, they have their primary care physicians yeah. in the area, yeah. they have their OBGYNs in the area, yeah. they have you in the area, yeah. they have their radiation oncologist if necessary yeah. in, the in the area. So we all are in a constant communication with each other just to provide that most comprehensive care to patients. And now that uh, Rob Wood Johnson yeah. Barnabas is looking to become one EMR system it, and one yes. system, we're yeah. now going to be able to share all of the information exactly. from one doctor to another electronically, which will allow you to make decisions even better, yeah. more accurate, not having to uh, repeat things that have already been done also. Yes, it's very frustrating for patients. And, you know, I have experience as being a patient and, you know, being involved with my family member's care, just having to call, you know, a doctor's office, fax me your report so I could send this to my doctor. And it's very frustrating to coordinate care. So if we could alleviate some of that burden on patients and their families, and then we could do ourselves just having one EMR system, I think it's great just to being able to, you know, talk with and collaborate with other physicians involved in their care. And the other thing is being that we have the medical school as part yes. of it also, yeah. we can also collaborate with some of the people who exactly. actually were the ones who instituted some of these immunotherapies, yeah. et cetera. Yeah, so actually, you know, um, when we have a patient uh, who did great on one certain immunotherapy, that really just gives us 
um, ideas for the next clinical trial. You know, this worked for this patient, or this doesn't work for some patient, or maybe this patient, you know, the patients provide us um, all this information um, to really help other women as well. So they're their own advocate, uh, but they're also advocates for other women with the same cancer. So we take it back to the medical school, to the researchers, people in lab, and say, you know, this is what is relevant to patients today. You know, can you help us figure out a solution for this? So just hand in hand, we're working together closely um, just to bring those exciting, you know, technologies and treatment available here. Now we've talked about clinical trials. Yeah. What, do, what do patients need to know about clinical trials and why should they participate in clinical yeah. trials? I know some patients are very weary of clinical trials. They're like, you know, it's not standard of care yet. You know, what is available to me? Why should I be involved? And I say, you know, all your standard treatments that we give you were part of a clinical trial once before. They became standard because we were able to study them in a safe manner, in a, you know, um, in a routine manner so that it can be a standard. So once you have had those standard treatments, and, and unfortunately if your disease has progressed, that, that there is no other available standard treatments, clinical trials are the best way to get involved because you may have a drug that is promising um, and it's being studied right now and you could be part of that exciting um, just journey and just getting that drug early enough so that it could actually benefit you and hopefully just you know um, increase your overall uh, life. Uh, span. Well, so. we can go back to chemotherapy drugs. We did not put chemotherapy drugs together until we did clinical trials. Exactly, yep. We didn't follow protocols and follow cycles and things like that until we put people through clinical trials. Yep. And the people got these medications earlier than they would have exactly. because they were part of the clinical trials. Yeah. And now that immunotherapy is becoming so much more, uh, it sounds like it's it's going to become pushing more of chemotherapy to the side exactly. because it's more specific to the type of cancer that the yeah. person has. Yeah. The ability to get involved in a clinical trial with yeah. immunotherapy means that the person may have a much better outcome. Exactly, yeah. So, you know, initially chemotherapy, we had a lot of chemotherapy drugs. We studied them in clinical trials. But unfortunately, after a while, your disease may become resistant or not uh, not respond to certain chemotherapy drugs. And at that moment, you know, we really want to target your specific cancer. Even though everybody may have ovarian cancer, your tumor may uh, respond to specific drugs, um, which is what we call precision medicine today. So, you know, th the fact that we could actually study your um, tumor, your genetic makeup of it, um, if there are specific mutations that drive, um, that make the that makes it um, your tumor, we could actually target that. Um, so it's very exciting for us to really offer the patients very precise therapy, um, hopefully with less side effects, you know, not just giving a general chemotherapy drug that may, you know, work, but, you know, eventually may become unresponsive. Which, again, part of the whole team approach to this medicine yeah. is... Yeah. You know, it's, it's like years ago when we used to look at whether it was estrogen positive or progesterone. Yeah. Now yeah. we have much more precision and we can actually look at the genetic makeup of the uh, cancer or the disease and actually target those exactly. genetic factors. Yeah. So, there, you know, pathology before used to just have like few stainings here and there that would guide our treatment plan. But now we have so many different markers that we could look at with pathology as well as geneticists um, that could really uh, break it down to even even minute details. That Which really again is it. part of Robert Wood Johnson. Exactly. They have Barnabas has one of the best pathology departments exactly. where they actually yeah. do a lot of that electron microscopy, et cetera, is part of the whole team approach to yeah. the treatment yeah. of cancers yeah. and gynecologic cancers. Yeah. People, you know, who have the best outcomes are people who get involved with the team. You know, no individual can give you the best treatment, you know. So just having a team of your pathologists, your um, cancer doctor, um, your geneticist, uh, radiation oncologist. So having that team approach, I think, provides a comprehensive cancer care, and that could really um, that could really impact your outcome. So, you know, we definitely encourage patients to really seek out, you know, CINJ that provides it. And of course, we, what we left out was the social service part, the yeah, part of yeah. it also. No, that's as, as important. So just having, you know, actually, um, I was just talking to someone from Somerset, you know, just with cancer care, it's not just about medicine or just getting a treatment, but it may be the other, other social, you know, aspects of it, whether, you know, someone was saying that, you know, I want to pay for my medications, but I don't have gas because I, I don't have the financial means to pay for 
my gas bill. So the hospital actually somewhere said provided money, financial means to cover their gas so that, that they could focus on their cancer care. So it's just having like being able to see everything um, as part of cancer care, I think is very important. Which again goes back to the leadership of Robert Johnson, yeah, Barnabas Health. They're very Health. committed, I think, uh, to the overall well-being of the patient, not just here, let me give you some medication, but let me look at your social aspect. Let me look at everything, medical primary care aspect um, and cancer as well. So that all kind of combines into one. Well, it's not health care, it's a health system. Health system, yeah, so we were just talking about that, yeah. It's the whole team approach yes. from beginning to end, to end. Yeah. from the time that the person sees their primary yeah. care yeah. to all of the testing that's done, yeah. to the pathologist that reads all of the tests, exactly. to the gynecologic oncologist, yeah hematologist, et cetera, and of course, as important to everything else, is the transportation, exactly, the follow-up, yeah, yeah. the social services that are involved. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of social service needs that exactly. the uh, Robert Johnson provides. Exactly, yeah, we were just saying that there is actually a fund at Somerset that actually covers, you know, if you have trouble getting to the hospital, to office visits, we have uh, funds available for patients, especially with cancer, who need that desperately. Um, so it's amazing that, you know, we're able to provide that for, for patients, because that's just as important. If you can't get, you know, a right to your doctor, you're not going to get the best cancer care. So before we wrap it up, yeah. is there something that you want to tell the audience? Yes. You know, I know going to your gynecologist um, just in a regular fashion is, you know, sometimes very hard for women. Um, just having a pelvic exam is very difficult for women, and I understand because I'm a female. Um, but I think it's very important that we treat ourselves, you know, if we are worried about certain aspects, you know, I don't want females to feel that there is no doctor that could treat them. You know, we are, you know, I am passionate about women's health and um, definitely seek out uh, a doctor that you trust and uh, to really provide uh, women's health um, so that we could keep every woman healthy. And whether it be your primary care doctor, doctor your or family, gyne practitioner, family practitioner, or your gynecologist, yeah. it's important it's to important, keep yeah. your foot in the door, exactly. get in there. Yeah. And also the other thing too that they need to understand is there's no such thing as a stupid question. No, no, especially not, yes. Because any question that they give yeah. may actually give more history of exactly. what's going on. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much for being Thank here. Thank you so much. For your... This concludes our episode of Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital's Health Talk. Please remember the opinions expressed here by our medical experts are not a substitute for medical advice from your own physician. For a physician referral, please call 1-888-MD-RWJUH or visit us at www.rwbh.org forward slash Somerset. Thank you for being here and thank you for everything that you do for Robert Wood Johnson Barnabas Healthcare. And thank you also uh, the Cancer uh, Institute for allowing you to come up to here also. 